Okay, we're in good shape now. So that took a little bit longer, but we'll be okay. We got uh, plenty of stuff lined up. So, or I should say plenty of stuff lined up for about a 45 minute lecture. So we'll be in good shape. Um, give me a, a quick yes, no over in chat to um, let me know if the audio is okay. I can either turn it up or turn it down. Yep, pretty good. Okay, cool. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. So um, we've got our two lectures today, right? We've got our um, morning lecture or early afternoon and later afternoon. Um, we'll have some fika in between. I have peppermint tea this time. Uh, in the first half of the lecture for the first 40 minutes or so, um, we're going to look at a, just one more PFR example, right? Try to, to get a little bit more um, experience with um, PFRs. Uh, and then in the second half of the lecture, uh, we will start our um, investigation of special cases of the PFR. Um, and we'll, we will use the um, example that we're going to start with here, the landfill gas one that's written on the screen right now, um, as a, sort of a, a case study of the, the special cases that we're going to deal with. Um, later on. So let's get started with our um, landfill gas, which by the way, I've, I've set most of this up to be um, handwriting. There was a, a question over in chat I thought was relevant to point out. I think most of this will be handwriting. Um, we may solve one or two of these in, in MATLAB, um, but the idea is to sort of set them up and look at how the setups are, are different. Um, and then I can always post the uh, MATLAB code to solve them afterwards so that um, you can review it afterwards. Uh, so we're going to be looking at um, landfill gas. So landfill gas is kind of what it sounds like, right? If you have a landfill and it's filled up with stuff, and I designed a special brown color just for our stuff. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff in the landfill. Um, over time, you know, anything that's organic will start to break down. The, the microorganisms in there will start um, breaking down stuff inside of a land, landfill, um, and you will get some gas that comes off. Um, the top of the landfill, that's called landfill gas. It's not particularly um, mysterious why we came up with that, that particular word. So we can capture this landfill gas. Uh, so this is landfill gas. Um, if we are in a semi-normal size uh, landmill, landfill, like 2 million gallons, or sorry, 2 million pounds of, of stuff. Is it 2 million pounds? It might be actually 2 million tons. I don't remember. Um, whichever unit was correct. Uh, we get about 500 cubic feet per minute of landfill gas coming off of that. Um, and so that landfill gas, it's just out in the landfill. Uh, so it's about 25 degrees C, 1 ATM. Um, and then it's about 50-50 methane and carbon dioxide. So um, neither one of those are good for the environment. So we would like to try to capture it if we uh, can. So this is 50-50 CH4 and CO2. What we can do with that landfill gas, if we would like to do something with it, and presumably we would, um, is to first pressurize it because that 25C and, and 1 ATM is, is not particularly high pressure or high temperature. Um, so if we send it through a pump, or actually a compressor on the other side. Uh, compressor is for gas and a pump is for liquid. Um, we can up its, um, CFM is cubic feet per minute. We can up its temperature and pressure um, to about 700 K and nine bar. We might need a heat exchanger to do that. That's kind of hot. Um, but then again, we did compress it by almost a factor of 10. So it would have heated up a little bit. Um, but maybe we needed a heat exchanger too. We're not really worried about uh, exactly what happened there. Um, and then we want to send it to our reactor. Um, and so I'm going to draw our reactor as a fairly strange shape of a PFR, big tubular reactor. So this is a PFR. We're going to add more detail to our PFR in a minute. I just want to show you why we have our PFR. Uh, and then coming out the other side is the useful stuff. So coming out the other side of our um, PFR is something called syngas. Syngas stands for synthesis gas. Um, the reason it's called synthesis gas is because the two primary components of it are carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Those are both really helpful when it comes to synthesizing other molecules. Um, so for example, you could take those and turn them into some kind of a fuel. Um, and there, that wouldn't quite be... Uh, like a, a green energy, it would be renewable in the sense that you used carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in order to make the fuel. 
and then you can burn the fuel and put the CO2 back into the atmosphere. Um, but maybe you make a, a chemical like a polymer or something like that out of it. Um, you know, we, polymers go into things like masks and gloves and stuff like that, PPE. Um, but whatever we are doing, what we're, we're trying to produce here is syngas, um, because syngas is, is very, very useful. Um, it's, it's good for synthesizing other stuff. The PFR is not one giant PFR. Um, so it is an isothermal PSR, PFR. Um, it's also isobaric, which we're going to relax. We already know how to relax one of those restrictions. We know how to deal with isothermal systems. Um, the second topic of today's lecture is how to deal with uh, non-isobaric systems. So this PFR is actually going to be a series of smaller tubes. I'm not gonna draw them all, um, but it's on here. It's actually made up of 15 smaller tubes. And then those 15 smaller tubes are all housed inside one larger tube. That one larger tube is called the shell. Um, and that's a very common design for uh, maintaining isothermal or nearly isothermal systems. Um, because if, for example, the thing is highly exothermic and you've got all of these tubes sitting around, um, let me grab another pen like this. So if we've got tubes like this uh, and they're inside of a shell, you can kind of uh, spray water or steam or whatever it is over the outside of those tubes. Um, and that takes place in what's called the shell. Um, and so this is called a shell and tube um, PFR. There's a sketch of that in chapter seven in your book, um, right, right around like, I think it's 7.3. Um, there's a, a sketch of a, a shell and tube PFR. The diameter of each tube is two centimeters, which is common, right? If, if I need to control temperature, it's easiest to control temperature if the tube is not massive. If it's really big, I remember we talked about this, the, the scaling relationship, relationship between volume and surface area. Um, if, if it's really big, I have less surface area that has to then somehow try to get the heat out of the center of a very large tube. Um, and so that's, that's not good. Um, less surface area to volume, I should say, not just less surface area. And then the, the length of each tube is three meters. Um, and so they're, they're fairly long, but they're also skinny tubes. So we can um, create those uh, pretty easily. It's, you can just buy those. Um, the reaction that's happening inside of here is the methanol, or sorry, the methane and the CO2 uh, combined to form syngas at a ratio of two CO and two H2. So this is all gonna be gas phase. Um, pretty much any time you see a temperature and a pressure and then a bunch of things that look like gases, it's gonna be gas phase. Um, it's, it's really hard to liquefy hydrogen and um, do a reaction with it. it it's not possible, impossible, but hard enough. The rate law here is gonna be elementary and it's reversible, or excuse me, irreversible. And I guess before I write that, we should note, I'm just calling these A, B, C, D um, so that I don't have to carry around all of those components. So that's A, B, C, D. We're pretty much only going to be worried about A and B, but just in case we needed it. Um, so the rate here is C, A times C, B. So that's an elementary irreversible rate law. Um, and then our rate constant, K, we're just going to leave this as pretty simple for this example, um, which is just 0 0.1. Uh, and the units on here are cubic meters uh, per mole dot second. And so our, our goal is to say if that's our landfill gas um, coming out of whatever landfill we have, um, what's the conversion of um, methane? Uh, so if, if we're asking for a conversion of methane, maybe it's because we're most worried about removing methane from uh, the atmosphere, or I should say preventing it from getting to the atmosphere um, in the first place. Uh, but for whatever reason, we're at this moment, we're just interested in the conversion of CH4 um, which is, again, we're going to call that the conversion of A, uh, because that's the one that, that we're interested in. There's no reason you couldn't pick A to be the carbon dioxide if you wanted to. It would just kind of change actually almost nothing about this problem, but um, we're just going to arbitrarily choose methane as, as species A. Um, so a couple of steps that we're going to have to do uh, before we actually get to the material balance um, is dealing with the inlet flow.
So uh, knowing the conditions of the LFG here, um, the landfill gas over here, we know it's coming in at 500 cubic feet per minute, but cubic feet per minute is not going to be a particularly useful unit uh, because we have cubic meters and seconds over here. So we need to convert cubic feet per minute into meters per sec or cubic meters per second. I, I guess if, if you want to look up the, the conversion factors between there, you can. If I'm being honest, I usually just plug it into Google and say convert um, 500 CFM to cubic meters. Um, is K for 700K? Uh, yeah, it's constant. So um, we're just going to call this constant. So it's for any temperature um, that we need it to be at. So 500 cubic feet per minute um, is the same uh, if we're just doing a plain old unit conversion, then the 500 cubic meters or cubic feet per minute is 0 0.236 cubic meters per second. The, the tricky part here is that this is at, well, I don't want to say tricky, it's one of the tricky parts. This is at 25 degrees C and 1 ATM. But we sent it through a compressor, right? If, if you look up a little bit at our drawing, um, we were sending it through a compressor. So when it went through here, it changed the temperature and the pressure over here and over here. Um, it didn't change the molar flow rate or the mass flow rate, but if the temperature and the pressure changed, chances are the volumetric flow rate changed as well. Um, and so what we just calculated, this 0 0.236, is not the feed to the reactor, right? That volumetric flow rate to the reactor has to be adjusted to 700K uh, and 9 bar, um, which we can do by the, the ideal gas law if we wanted to, um, which we do want to. Um, yeah, CFM stands for cubic feet per minute. So we converted that to cubic meters. So if we take that same uh, 0 0.236 cubic meters uh, per second, and now we're going to use the ideal gas law, we can uh, figure out that this corresponds to 9.65 moles per second. Right? And this is equal to NT0. That's true regardless of the temperature, right? That the molar flow rate will not change depending on the, the temperature. But now we can use that 9.65 moles per second, and we know we have 9.65 moles per second at 1 ATM and 25C, and we also have 9.65 moles per second at 700K and 9 bar. Um, and so now we just kind of run the, the wheels in reverse and use the ideal gas law again to find out what our actual volumetric flow rate is going into the reactor. And so this is the volumetric flow rate um, that corresponds to the increased temperature. Um, so if NT0 is 9.65, our uh, T0 is 700K, that K is Kelvin, not um, the rate constant Kelvin. And we are out of symbols. We just don't have enough. Uh, and then our pressure is 9 bar. So that's our inlet pressure. right? Given this information, we can now use the ideal gas law again uh, to figure out that the actual inlet volumetric flow rate for our system is pretty tiny, at least in the units that we're interested in. 0 0.0042 cubic meters per second. That's the actual volumetric flow rate that we are interested in. So that's not, I, I guess I don't want to call that really like reaction engineering in the sense that we haven't applied any reaction in here, anywhere in here, but that's some pretty, you know, classic chemical engineering stuff. Um, if you think back to uh, 102 thermo, um, we could have easily asked the question, how much shaft work was required in order to do that compression, right? And was that compression enough to get us up to that temperature and pressure, or do we also need a heat exchanger coming afterwards? Um, so it, it's that sort of, of question, but we're, we're just not interested in the work component right now. Um, if you wanted to go back to 102, I'm, I'm sure it would um, look like one of the example problems that um, you had from there. Um, so just to, to highlight some of the numbers here, uh, we've got our NT0, our T0, our P0, uh, and now this is our, our V0. So we know an awful lot about what's coming in. Um, we also know that NA0 uh, is equal to NB0. So this is our um, CH4. And our NB0 is CO2. 
um, we know that those are equal because the problem statement told us that they're coming in at equal um, mole fractions, so 50%. Um, and so those would then be equal to one half of NT zero, which if I have that number written down somewhere, where did I write my NT zero? Um, 0 0.322. Wait, that's not it. Oh, right. Uh, let me, let's back up a step before we uh, get to this part. I'm going to move these down a little bit. Uh, that's not what I wanted. I know you can probably do that with a pencil and paper, so it's, you know, convenient. So each of these um, components that we have over here, actually my, my V0 um, is going to have a, an error in it that we're going to have to correct here in a minute. These are total. So these are total feed uh, to the reactor. But the reactor is made up of 15 tubes. Um, and so if you look back through uh, the discussion I have of a shell and tube heat exchanger in the um, textbook, what you will find is that the assumption of a shell and tube heat exchanger is that that feed gets equally distributed to each one of those tubes. Um, and so the actual NT0 that we're feeding to a single tube, um, which is sort of what we're going to be uh, interested in here. So if we're interested in the uh, feed to a single tube, the feed to a single tube is what we had before, 9.65 moles per second divided by the number of tubes that we have, which is 15. Uh, and so this new um, NT0 uh, is going to be, I think, 0.644 moles per second. But does it, then you have to ask yourself, well, what is the feed temperature to a single tube? That has not changed, right? If, if you imagine that this piece of gas, this piece of gas, and this piece of gas are all separated and sent to different directions. They have the same temperature, right? It, it's not that I took a third of the temperature out and sent it this way, and a third of the temperature this way, and a third of the temperature this way. It's the same temperature for all of them. So even though the flow got cut by a factor of 15 because it was going to a different tube, that would be just like you know, going into a, a, a swimming pool or something and scooping out a little cup of water, right? You change the mass, you went from the mass of the swimming pool to the mass inside the little cup of water, but you didn't change the temperature of that cup of water, right? It, it's the same as what it was for the big pool. Um, and so the, the temperature and the pressure haven't changed at all. So the inlet temperature and the inlet pressure are still uh, 700K and nine bar to a single tube. It, it doesn't matter if it's um, going to one or the other. If the shell was big enough, would there be a temperature between the inner and the outer tubes? Possibly. Um, if there was non-uniformity in the way that the uh, stream got pushed into the reactor in the first place, um, it's possible, yeah. Um, and so the, the mistake that I had made earlier was the volumetric flow rate is getting divided between all of the tubes, and I wrote the wrong one down up, up at the top. So the uh, individual volumetric flow rate is 0, 0.0. 4.2 cubic meters per second. That was my mistake from a moment ago. So let's get rid of this. So if we are only interested in a single tube, which is our, our material balance is built for one tube. It's not built for a series of tubes. Um, and so we have to do tricks like this uh, so that we can use our material balance and if necessary, our energy balance um, on just a single tube instead of uh, lots of tubes. Um, so we're, we're stuck with um, something like this. So our single tube feed and the one that we will use for all of our calculations uh, will look like this, right? These will be our inlet conditions to the single tube. Um, as you can imagine, it is very easy to lose track of some of those, like I did just there, right? I wrote the wrong volumetric flow rate. Uh, it's just a matter of carefully writing them down um, and realizing um, what's getting split and what's not getting split. Um, but it is definitely tricky. There's, there's no doubt about that. So our 50-50 mixture is, is still holding. Um, and so our inlet A and our inlet B to, a, I mean, remember, a single tube um, is now going to be 0 0.322 moles per second. Right? And that will be at 700K 9 bar. 
um, with a volumetric flow rate of 0 0.0042. Now we can go to our um, material balance. Um, so again, we're dealing with a, a plug flow reactor, so our general material balance will be DNA dV uh, is equal to the rate of A. The rate of A is equal to the uh, stoichiometric coefficient times the rate of the reaction, which is minus R, uh, and then KCA times CB. That was our elementary rate law. Oops, dropped the negative. There you go. Minus K. The concentration of A is the moles of A divided by the volumetric flow rate. So that's lowercase v, not uppercase v. And the concentration of B is molar flow rate of B divided by the volumetric flow rate of B. Uh, sorry, volumetric flow rate V, lowercase. And now we have to do some kind of tricks that are, are or substitutions tricks, if you want to call them tricks, that, that should at least begin to start looking like they're kind of familiar. Like we keep coming back to these same ideas of setting up the material balance here and then substituting stuff in over here, right? Uh, we've kind of used that approach um, quite a few different times. Because our um, dependent variable is Na, we want to try to write everything in terms of Na. So the Na that's already sitting over there is fine, but we need to work on Nb a little bit. So from our stoichiometry, anywhere that we have n sub b, that's going to be equal to the amount of b that was fed minus the amount of um, change of b, which is going to be the same as Na0 minus Na. The reason it's Na0 minus uh, Na is because that represents the amount of A that has reacted. And according to our stoichiometry up here, it's one to one, right? So for every one mole of A that gets destroyed, I have to have also destroyed one mole of B according to that reaction. Um, and so this results, if you um, notice that Na0 is equal to Nb0, uh, these two will cancel out, right? You'll get an Na0 minus an Na. Uh, or NB0 minus NB0. Um, and so NB will just be equal to NA. And that, that is something that I think um, John's example had that. I think I had an example earlier that had something similar. Um, that is only a coincidence of the way that the um, problem happened to be set up. Don't make the generic assumption that NA is always going to be equal to NB. Um, that, that usually will not be um, the case. It's just a coincidence here. Um, N sub T will be equal to however much we started with, um, plus the overall change, right? Not just the change of A, but the overall change. Um, and so that ends up being two times the moles of A that were reacted. So Na zero minus Na. If these don't look immediately obvious, use the stoic table um, and you'll be able to, to show that these are um, equivalent, uh, or I, I shouldn't say they, they're equivalent. They're not really equivalent to anything. They, they just are. Um, stoichiometric ratios require this. The two that's coming here is coming again from our stoichiometry in the following sense. On the outlet side, we now have four moles of stuff because we get two CO and two hydrogen. But on the, or sorry, on the product side, we have four moles of stuff. On the uh, reactant side, we have two moles of stuff, right? One CH4 and one CO2. So every time that reaction proceeds once, right? Every time one CH4 and one CO2 react, we now end up with two more molecules than we started with. Um, and so that is the reason for our two um, that sits in this particular uh, number right here. Uh, we get a, a total of, of two that are sitting there. Um, yeah, there's a, a question in chat. Does this term equal squiggle? Yes. So if, if you wanted to, to replace um, any of those with squiggle, you could. But remember that because this is a, a PFR and it's going down the length of the PFR, this is true anywhere inside of our PFR, right? It's, it's not just that I'm looking at the beginning of the PFR to the end of the PFR. Anywhere inside of the, the PFR, these um, relationships are true because everything is kind of moving in a little chunk from one side to the other. Um, so if we substitute these uh, back into our material balance, we'll have DNA dV. Remember the V in our material balance is always the volume V. Um, that's never going to be the volumetric flow rate. 
uh, we'll have a constant term that sits out front. So that'll be uh, k and t0 squared divided by v0. Uh, and then it's going to be a big old mess that sits here. N sub A squared divided by NT0 plus 2NA0 minus 2NA. And all of that is also squared. Let me erase that. The reason that we got that uh, was because we also had to replace our V. Right, the, the volumetric flow rate down here on the bottom um, is not constant because this is a, a gas phase system. So what we had to do was replace, oh, I cannot write in highlighter. Uh, we had to replace V with V0 times NT over NT0 times T over T0 times P0 over P. Two of those canceled to one. Right, the T over T0 and the P0 over P0, those are one because the system's isothermal and isobaric. But we're still stuck with the other one, right? We still have an NT and we still have an NT0. Um, those are not going to be the same. We just showed that NT is not equal to NT0 because of this extra term sitting over here on the side. Um, and so that's where these extra terms, that's why we went from a V up here to a V not here. And that's where this extra NT0 came from. It was coming from that conversion that we just did, uh, which again is, is only the case for um, gases. We would not have to do something like that if we were um, dealing with uh, liquids. So that one is, is also inside of there. Maybe a, a cleaner way to do this would be to move, let's move this down. Right, put that one there and then put this one here. And then we could even just erase the sins right there, right? It, it's just one more step of our analysis. We had to get rid of the V uh, and express V as a function of NA. Um, and this was how we do that for um, gases. This differential equation that we've got down here is subject to the initial condition that NA zero is 0 0.322 moles per second. And now we got to solve that thing. Uh, if I had to solve that thing by hand, I would probably question the person who is asking me to solve it by hand and say, why are you asking me to solve that by hand? I'm not sure that you can solve that by hand. I'm sure there is some like terribly nasty looking um, expression that could potentially handle it. You might have to do like partial fraction decomposition or something like that, because you're going to have a quadratic in NA in the bottom and then an NA squared on top. I, I won't rule it out that it is possible to solve that thing by hand. Um, it would not be my, my choice. Um, I would probably take that and dump it in a MATLAB, which is exactly what I did. Um, so if we integrate this in MATLAB, we're going to integrate that from V is equal to zero up to V of one tube, right? We're not doing the volume of the reactor. We're doing the volume of a single tube. And the reason is we have, um, why is it 0.322 and not 644? Oh, the 644 was the total. Um, and it's half A and half B. So we cut it in half to be um, NA0. Uh, why are we doing the volume of a tube instead of the volume of the entire reactor? because our differential equation is only set up for a single tube. That's exactly why we had to do all this nonsense here about you know, subdividing the flow equally among all tubes, uh, taking the volumetric flow rate and recalculating it for a single tube. Um, when we do the integral, we have to also be careful uh, that the bounds of the integral are just going from the inlet volume of one tube, which is zero, it starts off as zero, uh, to the final volume of that same tube, which is again just one tube. Um, and so this looks like a quarter pi diameter of the tube squared times length of the tube. So that would be two centimeters and three meters um, because that was given in our problem statement. So this ends up being 0 0.85 cubic meters. If we were to write that in um, MATLAB, which um, 
if we have a tough, actually, I'm not going to write this one in MATLAB. We'll try to write the next one in MATLAB because we're just going to come back to this example in a moment. Um, but we can kind of sketch out what the code would look like. Uh, the outlet would be a vector of volumes um, and a vector of NA because those are our, uh, the, the V is our independent variable and the NA is our dependent. Um, and then we would set that equal to ODE four fives, or not really set it equal to, assign it as the output of ODE four five. We'd have to write a local function. Uh, and then we would assign our uh, limits, our span for volume to be zero up to 0 0.0085. And then our initial condition would be 0 0.322. For our local function, the, the at fun that's sitting here, this thing would have to be our calculation of this, right? So we would then have to insert all of this into our local function, which isn't awful, right? There's not too much there. There's an NT0, a K, a V0, and an NA0. So there's like four constants and, and an NA squared. Um, so it, it's not awful um, to set something up like that. Personally, if I were going to try to do this from scratch, I probably wouldn't have done all those substitutions. I would have just solved it for NA and NB. But that is like one of four different ways that we could solve this thing. Um, and we're going to look at another one here um, in a couple of minutes. So um, if, if you see a different approach, it's one of those joyous times where the answer as somebody who's trying to teach you this is really easy. Yes, they have to be the same. Whatever approach you go to setting up these differential equations, you have to get the same answer every time. Um, and so you can kind of learn a lot about where you make algebraic mistakes if you try them in two different ways and then do it a third way over in MATLAB and, and see if they're, they're different or not. Um, you know, because you have so much time uh, to do that kind of guess and check. So if we were to end up doing that, then our NA uh, at the end, um, which is to say NA at uh, the outlet of one of our tubes. Uh, if we were to calculate that, um, would be equal to 0 0.049 moles per second. Why did I say NA of end? I said NA of end um, because I'm assuming that you're going to extract it out of MATLAB. Um, and so remember, NA is coming out as a big vector, just like V is, right? V, v is coming out as a column vector, and then you're getting A, NA as a column vector. Um, and this is the NA that we want, right? Because that corresponds to the NA that's coming out of our um, tube. And if we were going to access that in MATLAB, the way that we would do that would be to say NA of end, um, because that's at the very end. We don't know how many elements are in there. It, it could be one, two, all the way up to maybe like 40. Um, but it could also be, if it's a, like a hard differential for MATLAB to solve, there could be 72 elements in there. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen it more than about 150 elements. It's usually not that problem. Um, but that's part of the problem with ODE45 is we don't know how big those vectors would be. Um, and that's why we need the end that's sitting here. There are tricks to, to force it to be a particular size. Um, and those are given in, I think, chapter 6.3, I think. I'm trying to remember the subsection. Um, but if you go back to the intro to, or, or the MATLAB 2 section, which is chapter 6, there are ways to trick ODE 4.5, excuse me, into forcing this to have a certain number of elements. But I usually don't bother unless I've got a good reason um, to do so. So at any rate, we don't know how many it is, uh, but it's, it's just coming out at the end. Yeah, NA of end, there's a question in chat. Um, that is exactly what that means. Um, so this is equivalent to saying, what is NA when V is equal to 0 0.0085? Those are exactly the same. Yep, that's a uh, spot on way to interpret that. And then if I want to calculate the um, corresponding conversion, which is the one that uh, is coming out of our reactor, that's the, the classic in minus out over in, uh, which is one minus 0 0.049, too many zeros, divided by 0 0.322, which ain't half bad. Um, this is 84.7%. Uh, make a note of that number uh, because we're going to compare numbers uh, in a little bit, um, but that's what our, our conversion of A is, um, which isn't bad. Uh, 85%, about 85% conversion is, is pretty good. If you needed a profile, 
Um, these are not profiles, right? These are, are just numbers. Um, but if this was coming out of MATLAB and you needed a profile, um, you could do something like um, plot of VNA. That would give you a plot of the molar flow rate of, of A exiting your reactor. If you wanted a profile of conversion, that would be plot V and then one minus NA divided by 0 0.322. And this would be a, a conversion profile, right? Um, and the last element of the conversion profile would be 84.7% or, or 0 0.847. But we didn't ask for a profile anywhere in our um, problem statement, so we're not going to be plotting any of those. Um, again, I, can, I will post the, the code for that um, afterwards, um, but we're going to kind of develop another approach here in a moment. Um, and I think we'll have enough time to actually like show the code for this one. So. Um, We'll, we'll just do that separately. So that's the end of the example in the sense that the only thing that the example asked us to do was calculate the conversion of methane, uh, which is the conversion of A, and we've converted about 84.7 of the methane. Notice the conversion is the same, right? It, it's the same, this molar profile. I don't want to say notice because we didn't actually point that out. It's not particularly evident, um, but this profile is the same for all the tubes. So every individual tube has exactly the same profile. That's the assumption of our shell and tube design is that it's exactly the same everywhere. Um, if you needed to worry about it not being the same everywhere, about the actual flow maybe not dividing equally between all of those, you're in for a, a, a tough challenge. You might have to do some kind of like a full numerical simulation um, just to, to figure that out. I, I don't know if we would have a, a good way to decide um, exactly how the flow gets distributed uh, without like doing an experiment or, or doing a, a, like a full computer simulation or something like that. Um, our assumption for shell and tube, it's the same profiles through each one of the individual tubes. If for some reason we needed the um, total amount of A exiting the reactor, so A exiting reactor, this is the sum of A uh, exiting the tube. Exiting tubes. We don't really have a symbol for that. We don't it's, it's not like NT0 is the sum of NA0 and NB0 and NC0, something like that. Um, but if for some reason you needed to know, you know, the, the total amount of hydrogen coming out, you could figure out the amount of hydrogen leaving one tube and then just multiply by 15 because it's the same for all of them, which is the same as just like summing everything up. Um, the overall conversion will end up looking the same. Um, so you can kind of play around with what's different and what's similar. Um, by, by looking at uh, sums that look like this. So that actually is the end of our PFR stuff. Um, I'm gonna briefly introduce our next topic before we get to uh, FICA, because we're coming up on FICA here in about four or five minutes. Um, this is our, our special topics. So chapter eight um, is PFR special topics. So uh, the pattern here is very similar to what it was for a CSTR, right? We weren't learned first the, the general case for the CSTR, which can solve all of them. Um, and that, that's never anything that you can't always go back to and say, yep, I can solve that. Um, but there are some special cases of CSTRs, just as there are special cases of PFRs um, that are useful to uh, look at. The first one that we're going to look at um, is uh, since we wanted um, XA, we can write our material balance and our energy balance directly as functions of um, XA. As with our CSTRs, the only time that we should ever rewrite a material balance in terms of conversion is only if there is exactly one reaction. If you have more than one reaction, don't rewrite them in terms of conversion because it will not help you. But if you do have one, uh, you can actually come up with at least something that looks mildly like an easier differential to solve. Um, and it can be a little bit more helpful because you have less things to carry around in the meantime. 
um, which we're going to demonstrate right now by resolving our syngas problem. The general approach for rewriting the material and the energy balance is to start with our derivative, which is ddv of na. So I'm writing it a little bit different there, but this is the same as dna dv. Right, all I'm doing is making it a little bit more evident what is our um, independent variable and what's our dependent variable. N sub A is directly related to X. Uh, so we can rewrite this as DDV of um, N sub A is equal to NA0 times 1 minus XA. NA0 is a constant. X sub A will end up varying along the length of the reactor. Um, and so we can apply our uh, chain rule here to bring out that NA zero uh, and give it a minus NA zero, uh, and then that'll be equal to DXA DV. This is then equal to what it used to be equal to, which is R sub A. If you rearrange that, you get sort of the, the standard format for the material balance for a PFR in terms of conversion, which is DXA DV uh, is equal to minus RA divided by NA zero. Um, this is a boxed equation in your book because, as I said, that's equivalent to the PFR uh, material balance. But it's only good if you have one reaction. The initial condition for this is that xA of V is equal to zero is zero. So that's also a little bit easier, right? You may not have to worry too much about your initial condition because it's always going to be zero because um, our conversion starts at, at zero. This equation, if you need it in the book, is 8.2 along with its derivation. The energy balance follows almost exactly the same um, approach and that's in uh, 8.3. So you can rewrite the energy balance in terms of, of conversion as well. The part that's lengthier about this that we sort of um, subdivided into steps for the previous one uh, is that we have to use um, C sub i as those more complicated expressions that we had briefly mentioned before, which is either equation 5.11 for a liquid or um, 5.14 for a gas. And that's exactly what we're going to do um, after FICA. So this is for a liquid and this is for a gas. Um, and so the approach ends up being to, to put those concentration terms back inside of our rate law and then to put our rate law inside of our material balance um, and, and see what happens. Um, so we're up to about, actually we're just like slightly behind it. Um, no one, so there's a good question in chat. Does one reaction exclude reversible reactions? Not if you write it in the way that we normally write it. So if you write your reversible reaction rate um, as KCA minus, for example, CB over KC, you're still good. Um, you, you can use XA for that. If you had another reaction on top of that, then you'd kind of be in a bad shape. So I'm going to go heat up my water. I got some peppermint tea. Let's throw that uh, studio. How do you say, is it, is it Ghibli or Ghibli? I don't know how to pronounce it. But I'm going to throw that back on. Uh, I want to say it's Ghibli. Is it Ghibli? I, I've always heard Ghibli. I'm not sure. But. I've, I don't think I've ever actually heard it pronounced. Which, by the way, if anybody's thinking of making fun of me, go for it. I don't mind. Um, but I, I always I heard this great line once. Never make fun of somebody who doesn't know how to pronounce something but knows what it is because that means they learned about it by reading and you should never dissuade somebody from reading. Um, unfortunately, I didn't come up with that until about six years after my former advisor made fun of me for mispronouncing something, but it stuck with me, so now I remember it. Um, all right, so we'll take about 10 minutes for um, Fika and then we'll come back at about three and we'll look at how to solve this. I've also opened up chat in case anybody wants to chat over there.
You guys want to see my Lego? I built a Lego. They designed it to like latch into place, which is pretty cool. Yeah, come here. But that Lego goes with this Lego. That's like the one part of the Lego. This is the other part of the Lego. So it's a little bit bigger. So it's a bucket wheel excavator. Bailey, come here. See, John gets his dogs in front of the camera, and I put my Legos in front of the camera. I would get Winston, but Winston, he's sacked out. Yeah. How long did that Lego take? Uh, like a month. I can't do it for more than like 45 minutes at a time. Um, yeah, it's just a bit much for me. Yeah, you tell him. Yeah, you tell him. Now I dig mechanical engineers. Right, that's where we stop. Like I just say I need a pump <laughs> and then I leave it up to them to actually build the thing. That's tough. I wouldn't want to do anything like that. That'd be tough. Let's see, okay. Let me get a little bit, oh, I think actually the studio is still playing. All right, let's see what else we can do with this. If we wanted to solve that um, syngas problem again, we're, we're at three, so we're gonna keep rolling here. If we wanted to do the, the same syngas problem, um, but sort of like check our math, right? What, there, there could be another way to do it. Maybe we put it into MATLAB in the way that we normally would um, because there is one reaction, another approach that 
may stand out is, hey, I remember there used to be this uh, form of the material balance that's written in terms of conversion, and you're asking me for conversion. It seems like it's sort of uh, designed for something like that. So let's see what happens if we try to use this expression um, instead of uh, the material balance as we, we saw it before. Uh, and again, uh, we should keep in the back of my, our minds, we've got to get the same thing. Um, we have to calculate the same conversion. Um, so if we don't, then we've made a mistake somewhere. So uh, we start off with our material balance, which is dxa dv. Those 10 minutes go by so fast. I always want like another 10 minutes of fika. But we have no time. Science stops for no one. Uh, minus ra over na0. Um, and now we uh, substitute in our um, rate law. Uh, and our rate law is going to be uh, k. CA, CB, divided by NA0. Uh, and this will be subject to the initial condition that event initially XA of V is equal to zero is zero. And so this is the part that I had mentioned at the very last point before we left for FICA, is the general approach of trying to use conversion is that you write the material balance this way, and then you have to figure out what C sub i is. Um, and we had briefly used those big expressions for C sub i with our special cases of the CSTR, and they pop up again here for special cases of the PFR. Um, and generally, we go to either 511 for a liquid or 514 for a gas. It, it just depends on which phase you're dealing with. Um, here, we're dealing with a gas. Uh, and so our C sub A will look like, um, oops, I need a little bit more space there, C sub A zero times theta A minus the stoichiometric coefficient of A over A times X A. By the way, I do not memorize these things. Um, I always just go back to the book whenever I need them because uh, there's little things that I never remember. One minus Ya0 stoichiometric coefficient of A over A. Or no, I'm sorry, that top one is a delta. Oh, no. uh, sometimes these things get just a little too close to each other. Okay, screw it. I'll just redraw that. Uh, delta over the stoichiometric coefficient of A times XA. And then this is those terms that came from the um, ideal gas law, P0 over P and T over T0. So let's take a look at, um, no, there's, there's no P0 over P uh, for the top. These two still go to, they don't cancel out, they just go away because they're one, because it's, it's isothermal and isobaric. Um, the new over new A is, is also one. Uh, new A over new A is also one. Theta A, remember any theta I is moles of I fed divided by moles of A fed. Uh, so theta A uh, is always one. And so our numerator simplifies a fair amount to just one minus XA. And in fact, for A, it always looks like one minus XA. Uh, no, oh, okay, now I understand your, your question in chat. No, the, the top part I wrote correctly. It's nu A over nu A, but for the bottom, it's delta over nu A. Uh, let's see. Y A zero, we know from our problem statement, is a half. Uh, we know that our delta was plus two. Our stoichiometric coefficient of A was minus one. This was being multiplied by our uh, one half. So we have a one half times a two, which is a one, divided by a minus one, which is minus one. Um, but then it's actually subtracted off up here at the beginning. So it ends up looking like a plus one. Um, so our denominator looks like one plus xa, right? It starts out really ugly, but kind of the nice part about this is in a lot of cases, the, the expression for c simplifies fairly well, um, which is nice. We got to do the same thing for C sub B. So C sub B will be CA zero times, this time it's theta B. That is supposed to be a capital theta. Um, 
you can judge for yourself, preferably silently, how well I can draw a theta b. Uh, stoichiometric coefficient of b over stoichiometric coefficient of a times xa. And the denominator looks exactly the same as what it did before. So 1 minus ya naught delta stoichiometric coefficient of a times xa, p0 over p, and t over t0. You can also judge, again, preferably silently. You don't have to tell me about it, uh, how bad I may be at making my nu look different from my v, uh, but that's, that's how it goes. Um, yeah, so there's a good question in the chat. How come this is not CB0? It's not CB0 because we're trying to express everything in terms of A. The, the sort of CB0-like term um, is buried inside of theta B. Uh, and so theta B uh, is equal to the moles of B being fed divided by the moles of A being fed. So there, there's kind of like CB0 sitting inside of there. If, if you do enough algebra and spread everything back out, it can kind of be thought of to exist in there. Um, but the algebra that we did to originally develop these expressions just worked out in such a way, I, I mean, it didn't just work out that way. We intended it to be written so that the majority of the information we need is about CA um, or CA0. I don't need to erase that. Uh, and so that's why the, the thing that looks out front is, is still CA0. Um, and so our top up here, ends up looking like 1 minus xa, uh, and our bottom is exactly the same as before, which is 1 plus xa. Uh, as we had seen previously, we noted that na had to be equal to nb by stoichiometry. That sort of implies that because they're both being divided by the same volumetric flow rate, that ca also has to be equal to cb, um, and we just sort of came up with that uh, exact same similarity here without having to actually recognize it by stoichiometry just turns out that if you plug in the stoichiometry correctly, CA is equal to CB, and that's because NA is equal to NB. Um, so it's just a, at least we've got a little sanity check here that our approach on the other um, solution was, was probably okay, at least on that step. Um, so that's good. So we can substitute these now back into our uh, material balance, and we get DXA DV. Um, this is going to be equal to kind of a lump of constants first. So we'll have a K. We'll get two CA zeros because we have two Cs, and they both have a CA zero in them. Uh, and then underneath it, from the original expression, we still have an NA zero. And then we have two of these terms that look like 1 minus XA divided by 1 plus XA. Right? And then this will be subject to our initial condition that xa of 0 has to be equal to 0. So what I mean by having sort of two separate approaches, we know that they're really the same approach, right? They're, they're just different ways of writing a material balance and an energy balance. But if, if my entire career was based on the answer to a single question, and that single question was, do I get the same answer for this differential equation as I do for this differential equation? I do, I, it's coin flip, right? I have no idea if I'm gonna get the same thing from both of those. I know conceptually that I have to, but just from looking at the form of those equations, I could not tell. Um, and so that's what I mean by you sort of have two quote unquote independent methods of getting the same answer. They're not really independent, they're exactly the same thing, they're the material balance. But in terms of doing the math and stuff like that, they kind of feel independent, right? They're, they don't look particularly similar. Um, and so that's why I, I say you can use them to sort of check your work uh, because they feel different enough while you're writing them and they look different enough um, that you can use them as sort of a, a check um, on each other. Uh, it's 3.10. Let me write, actually, I think we've got all of these really quick. Let's jump over into MATLAB real quick um, and we'll solve this thing. So here is our MATLAB. I'm going to have to try to flip back and forth to get all of our stuff. The script portion, um, xa0 is initially 0. Um, and our vmax, which is really the v of a tube, um, I'm going to have to scroll back up on those notes that I was writing a minute ago so that I can remember where all this stuff was. There we go. 
um, our, our single tube volume was 0 0.0085, and that was cubic meters. What we expect to get out are two vectors for V and XA, one vector each, and those should be coming from ODE45, which is evaluating our function from zero to V tube, subject to the initial condition XA0. Um, and then I'm just gonna print the last one. Uh, we'll just print XA event, right? Because the only thing that we're being asked for here is the last element of, of XA. Uh, and then our local function will be to solve DXA DV, um, and that'll be a function of generally V and XA. We need a couple of our um, constants. So we know from the problem statement that uh, K was 0.1 cubic meters per mole second, I think is what those were before. Um, and then we had all of those other uh, quantities, right? We had NA0 was um, 0 0.322, and that was a mole per second. We knew T0 was 700. Actually, we don't need any of the Ts, so let's not worry about that. V0 is 0 0.0042, and that was a cubic meter per second. Uh, what else did we need? We needed a CA0, but we can calculate CA0 as NA0 divided by V0 and that'll be a mole per cubic meter. So we had to, to calculate one of those. Um, and let's see, we are now dealing with our XA. We're gonna need to calculate our XA. Oh, we already know what our XA is. Yeah, that's our input value. So now we need DXA DV. Uh, and this is equal to everything that we just saw a moment ago, which is K times CA0 squared. Uh, and then that divided by NA0 times a quantity of one minus XA divided by one plus XA, and then that quantity squared. Uh, and if I just stare at this and try to figure out, do I have all of the values? Uh, K, CA0, NA0, XA is up there, and that one is good. So I think I do. This is usually the approach that I take. It, it looks like I do. I'm just gonna let MATLAB tell me um, if I've forgotten anything. Uh, let me just save this once, delete me. Um, I will post this code too, so if, if you couldn't follow along with it, that's okay. And there we go. Cool, we got it. So 0.847, right? 84.7, which is exactly the same number that we got um, a moment ago, which is great, right? We, we should have done that. Uh, I would say arguably that is a simpler differential equation to write uh, in terms of coding this up than it was for the, the general approach that we saw in the first part of class. But, you know, at the same time, we did a lot more work on paper, um, which tends to be a little bit more subject to error. So it, it really comes down to personal preference, right? Which, what is the right combination for you of doing some stuff by hand and then doing some stuff in MATLAB? If you can get to the point where you could have solved this, that was a separable differential equation. It, you can separate all the x's on one side and everything else onto the other. It just becomes a question of whether you can evaluate that integral. Um, it, so my guess is you would need MATLAB sooner or later, uh, but it, it kind of comes down to you as to where do I want to actually do the MATLAB portion. So it's, you know, your call to an extent, right? I think sooner or later you're going to need um, MATLAB in order to do that. So again, I'll, I'll post this uh, script so you don't have to try to scribble it down really quick because um, we're going to keep moving on. Um, again, if you need the uh, energy balance, it, it looks very much the same. Uh, and Or sorry, not very much the same. Uh, it follows a, a similar approach as we did for the CSTR where you can rewrite that whole thing in terms of conversion of X. But if you need that one, you're still going to end up with um, a function that looks something like uh, dt dv. This is going to be a function of both xa and t. Um, and similarly, your xa, if you are uh, solving the energy balance, your dxa dv is also going to be a function of xa and t. Right, so you're still, it doesn't matter if you have one react, reaction and you can write it in terms of conversion, you're almost guaranteed to need Net MATLAB for anything that's non-isothermal because these two, uh, the material balance and the energy balance are still gonna be coupled. Um, so the, the solution to one is gonna be uh, dependent on the other one, 
uh, if you've got a non-isothermal system. And the approach for solving a non-isothermal system in terms of conversion, it's the same as the approach for solving a non-isothermal system in terms of molar flow rates. Um, so the, you still end up with a coupled set of ODEs that you then pretty much have to put in a MATLAB. Um, there's, there's not really a, a way around that. Now for something completely different. Let me leave these up here. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention, we got the, the right answer. I didn't even write this. Uh, I just have to erase this. So XA of end, let's erase this too, uh, is still equal to 84 points, 84.7 or 87.4, I don't remember. Yeah, 84.7. Right, so we ended up with indeed the same answer. Uh, and if we wanted to, we could compare this value uh, to the one that we should have gotten up here. Again, 84.7, solid. So I'll leave that there for a moment. Uh, new topic. So um, this is actually a, uh, something of a link to CNG 101A. Um, you will see more of this sort of a, a representation when you get to 101A. So 101A, we, we do this kind of a problem, right? We have pipe flow. If you are your little infinitesimal slice, actually, I can draw this as a nice little rectangle here, right? And let's say as an analogy that that slice is, is you and you're in the middle of a crowd. So you're gonna be kind of a, a lanky person, right? Big torso, actually big neck. Let's say you have a big neck instead of a big torso. And, and you're walking in a line, right? You're in a line for, a, uh, I don't know, roller coaster or something like that. I used to love going to um, Cedar Point when I was a kid. You're in line, right? And, and you try to move forward and the people behind you are trying to move forward and the people in front of you are trying to f move forward. What are the forces that you would feel as this, this tiny little element? Uh, and this is supposed to be an element in a tube. You would end up feeling three forces, only two of which we've actually dealt with so far. So we're not gonna introduce the third one. On the one hand, if there is a crowd behind you, they are trying to push you this way. The, the word that we have for that in uh, fluid mechanics or now in reaction engineering for what is the crowd behind you doing that's pushing against you? Um, this is what the crowd is doing that's called upstream of you, right? It, it happened up the stream of you, behind you. They are exerting a force on you because they're trying to get you to go in you know, the direction of the line. On the other hand, the people that are in front of you, those are acting like resistance, right? Imagine if the people behind you were the only ones moving and they started moving you forward, you would just get squished, right? The people in front of you, thanks to Newton's law, are applying an equal and opposite force to try to push you backwards. Um, and that represents in the, a tube analogy, or I should say fluid mechanics nomenclature, a force of the downstream components. Right, things that come at, uh, that are ahead of you in line, right? They're closer to the exit. They are also applying a force, but it's in the opposite direction. There's another force that we haven't taken into account yet because it's kind of small. There is some force between your shoes and the floor, right? And that's friction. Um, that is acting to slow you down. Once you start walking, you will eventually stop because friction will slow you down, even if there was no downstream force um, sitting in front of you. And that's the new force that we now have to think about. Actually, we haven't thought about any forces yet, um, but this force is usually small, but we have to um, account for it. This is friction, right? Friction is always opposing your direction of motion, um, and it's always there. It's just a question of whether or not it's important. Uh, it will be important in some cases and it will not in others. Um, and so that's what we're gonna try to uh, figure out right now. So if you go to um, equation 8.11 in your book, you will see a force balance uh, for flow in a tube. So for a tiny uh, PFR element. tiny volume element. This is section 8.2.
you will not have to do that force balance. Um, it's there so that you can see it. It's not a force balance any different than the force balance you would have seen in like a physics class. It's, you know, some of the net forces has to be equal to zero. Um, and that, that, or sum of forces has to be equal to, to zero. The part that's a little bit weird is that we introduce a, a function from uh, fluid mechanics that you probably haven't seen before. And the only important thing for us is what's the final result, right? What happens after we do that force balance? It's not a terribly convoluted force balance, but it takes like two pages or something to, to develop. But they're tiny pages, right? They're, I printed that book small. Um, and what you end up with is that because this force um, is equal to uh, pressure divided by area, so this is pressure divided by area, and this is pressure divided by area, we get that um, the, the, the pressure is not actually constant as you go down the length of the reactor because you're losing some of the energy that would normally be going to transferring the fluid that is being lost through friction, right? It, technically those molecules are heating up because they're rubbing against each other. Um, and so therefore the pressure that we started with is not the same as the pressure that we finish with because a little bit of the energy that was there that created that pressure in the first place um, is being dissipated through friction. Um, how did we find that out? We did a force balance. Um, it, it's not that pressure is being dissipated somewhere. It's, it's a result of the force balance and then cleverly writing the force balance in terms of, of pressure. Um, so you're welcome to review 8.2 if you want. The key point is that we can now decide how does pressure change along the length of the reactor. Um, and that comes in a form of a differential equation. So the change in pressure with volume, so this is change in P down the reactor. That's what dPdV means, right? It's the same as the change in conversion along the length of the reactor or volume of the reactor, change in moles, change in temperature, anything like that. P is now a new um, dependent variable. Uh, and so we're going to have to figure out how that changes as a function of volume. The way that it changes is simply a, an equation that came from a force balance that I am uh, not going to derive here. It's equal to minus the volumetric flow rate times a new parameter F, which I'm going to make a big old scripty F. This is, uh, I guess that's not really a reason I won't bring that up times a number that looks entirely arbitrary, but is in fact not arbitrary at all, 128 times MT. We'll define MT in a moment here. This is great. How often do you see pi cubed in a denominator times something else, a D to the seventh power? That's pretty dope. I like seeing large powers like that. Right, this, oops. Uh, is our new expression for the change in pressure uh, along the length of a reactor, specifically along the length of a plug flow reactor. So we're going to learn another type of tubular reactor in a moment here, um, which is not the same as this. Yeah, that's not a coincidence that 128 is 2 to the 7. So um, let's look at some of these parameters that uh, we're going to have to deal with here. Um, the V that sits here, the symbol next to it's an F. We're going to define it in here in a moment. This is our same old volumetric flow rate. This F is what we call a friction factor. It is another way of saying a fudge factor. It's saying we can get really close to the magnitude of the, the pressure drop. Um, but we still need a fudge factor. Um, and that fudge factor, we can actually solve for that exactly for a limited flow, for limited cases of, of flows. But in general, we don't know what that number is expect, except experimentally. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a fudge factor. Uh, but we call it a friction factor and we wrap it inside of lots of terms to make it look like we know what we're talking about. Another word for the uh, top part up here, the change in pressure, dp, Sometimes you will hear that referred to as pressure drop. There's another term for pressure drop, which is just the outlet pressure minus the inlet pressure, but sometimes the, the DP on the top there is, is pressure drop. M sub T is your total mass flow rate. 
The interesting thing about M sub T is that it's constant. Even in the presence of a reaction, the total mass flow rate is always constant. Why, I can hear you asking, Dr. Drews, why is total mass flow rate constant, but total molar flow rate is not? Or put another way, why is the mass conserved, but the moles are not? Because even if you take an atom and break it in two, you have the, or take a molecule and break it in two, you have the same number of atoms that were there before, the total mass is therefore the same. The way in which you have grouped them can be different, and that's why the number of moles is not um, constant. But M sub T, the total mass flow rate, is constant. Pi is pi. I don't have a, actually, I don't, pi is the, what, the ratio of the circumference to the diameter. I, I, it's, it's pi, it's 3.14. D is the diameter of the tube. The, the tricky part with this is that watch your units. The units on each one of these terms have to end up being something that gives you a pressure per unit volume. The, the pressure per unit volume that I usually recommend that you use, I'm going to move this over a little bit so I can write the uh, units over here. Typically, I recommend that you write units in terms of Pascal per cubic meter or Pascal per liter or Pascal per cubic foot or something like that. But try to put a Pascal as your pressure unit um, because you now have to watch the mass units on K, the length units on D, and the volumetric flow rate uh, units over here. F, the friction factor, is dimensionless. 128 is dimensionless, pi is dimensionless. So your units have to end up looking like pressure per unit volume, so like a Pascal per cubic meter. And I strongly suggest you get into the habit of whenever you have a pressure drop problem, just write everything in base SI units. So kilograms, meters, and seconds. And if you do that for all of the terms inside of the pressure drop, then the result is that you get a Pascal per cubic meter. But just watch your units. It is really easy to mess up units on a pressure drop. Or if I want to say that another way, I have found that it is very easy for me to mess up units on a pressure drop. Um, so keep those in mind. Um, the equation for F that we have uh, is empirical. And so it's not just F, but it's F is approximately equal um, to 0 0.0791 divided by the Reynolds number to the one quarter. If you are wondering where that comes from, I don't blame you. Uh, that is coming from a series of experiments that people do for flow in a tube, and they measure this thing, and they find out, hey, actually, we can relate all of those friction factors to that. Um, that is like a two-week topic in 101A about where these things are coming from and how they're used. So if you love it, great. You'll see it again. If you hate it, I'm sorry. You'll see it again. Um, and then the number that's sitting inside of there um, is a very common number in um, fluid mechanics. It's R sub E, uh, which its usual definition is, actually, I'm just going to skip its usual definition because we don't need it very much, uh, four times the total mass flow rate divided by pi times the diameter of the tube times a new Greek letter, which is mu. This number is called the Reynolds number. It is hugely important to fluid mechanics. It is like the single most used number in fluid mechanics. So anytime you have anything to do with pressure, I can almost guarantee you're going to bump into the Reynolds number. Um, this is dimensionless as well. So whenever you calculate a Reynolds number, you have to make sure that your uh, mass flow rate, MT, your D, and this other new parameter down here on the bottom, mu, um, work out such that all of the units cancel out. So our mu here is viscosity. It can be the viscosity of a gas or a liquid, but we only deal with um, two cases. If it's a liquid, then it's going to be 10 to the minus 3 pascal seconds. So this is for a liquid. If it's a gas, then it's going to be 10 to the minus 5 pascal dot seconds. That is a pascal dot seconds, not minus seconds but I can understand the confusion because it kind of looks like a minus sign. 
and that's for a gas. That is normally a function of the stuff that you're dealing with, right? And because we are dealing with a reactor, it's going to be a function of a mixture of stuff. It also tends to be a function of temperature. So it's kind of hard to evaluate that, but a good, what we call an order of magnitude approximation for liquids is that most of the time the viscosities are on the order of 10 to the minus three Pascal seconds. That's very, very close. If, if you want a, uh, an idea of what that number is, um, this is the viscosity of water. So that's the viscosity of liquid water. The majority of liquids that we will encounter uh, have a viscosity at least somewhere on the order of what water is. They can very easily be triple or double or quintuple or whatever, um, but they're, they're usually pretty close. This viscosity that we're given here, that's close to the viscosity of air. Of air. Um, and so on the, on, the road, on, the, on the whole, those are okay numbers to start with. So just use those numbers whenever we have um, one of these. Oh my God, that's a fantastic um, Valentine. So somebody posted in. There's another definition for a Reynolds number, which I don't want to use. Uh, so I'm not going to define any of these, but it's uh, rho u d over mu or rho v d over mu. And the Valentine is roses are red, violets are blue. Reynolds number equals rho v d over mu. I love that. Uh, that's wonderful. I'm going to try to remember that. I don't teach fluid mechanics again for a while, but I'm going to try to remember that. Um, yeah, it's equivalent. And I just made some simplifications here. Don't worry about anything I just wrote. You don't need it. Um, again, keep in mind that when we're doing um, this term, the m sub t, that is always going to be constant. Because that is a total mass flow rate that does not change in the presence, or I should say even in the absence, of chemical reactions. So this represents 811 up here, this one. This is equation 8.11 in your book. Uh, that is one more differential that we have to solve. Um, so we're going to have to go through it um, and solve everything all over again, except now we have an, an extra one. So let's see what would happen for our syngas problem, what, right? What would we have to calculate for our syngas problem? Um, and where would those numbers come from? And, and what are some of the, the sample calculations? So the, the question we're asking now is, what's the conversion in our syngas problem if we account for the presence of friction, right? And so the presence of friction is uh, encompassed in this pressure drop term. Um, and it is going to be coupled to our material balance through the V, right? Because remember the Vs had the, the P zeros and the Ps inside of them. Um, and so those two things are, are now gonna be coupled. Um, and so we're gonna work through that right now um, and see how those things um, are coupled to each other. So let's look at syngas, but now with pressure drop. So that's another way of saying a non-isobaric system, right? It's, it's going to not be isobaric. A lot of the initial values are the same. So uh, P0 was 9 bar. That's our inlet pressure, uh, which is 900,000 pascals. Our Na0 uh, is 0 0.322 moles per second. Remember, we're just dealing with a single tube right here. The pressure drop over multiple tubes is the same as the pressure drop over a single tube. The total mass flow rate is uh, molar flow rate of A times the molar mass of A plus the molar flow rate of B times the mol mass flow rate, or sorry, molecular weight of B, which is constant. And that, if we were to plug those in, is 0 0.0193 kilograms per second. Again, this is constant. I think it's so clever that that is constant because this does not have to be Na and Nb. You could replace them, or sorry, Na0 and Nb0. You could replace them with Na and Nb. You get exactly the same thing, um, which I think is great. How many conservation equations do we really have? Not that many. Mu, our viscosity, it's a gas, so we're just going to write it as 10 to the minus 5 pascal dot seconds. The diameter of our tube is 0 0.02 meters which is two centimeters. 
Notice that I'm trying to keep the units in base SI, right? I've used Pascals, Pascal, or sorry, meters. I've used Pascals because Pascals is all in base units. Uh, kilograms up here, seconds over here. Um, Pascals again for pressure up here. I am trying to keep those things in base units um, because that's gonna be helpful um, when it comes time to, to check units. So when we're dealing with our um, friction factor uh, it, or our pressure drop, it kind of comes in a, a reverse order, right? We calculate our Reynolds number, we put our Reynolds number into our friction factor, and then we put our friction factor into our pressure drop up here. Um, so we just kind of run it in, in reverse from the way that I've written it right there. So let's quickly evaluate um, each one of those, see where all of the Reynolds number or all of the values go. So our Reynolds number is 4mt uh, divided by pi times d times mu. I have everything in base SI units. So this ends up like 4 times 0 0.0193 divided by pi. Pi is dimensionless times 0 0.02 for our diameter times our viscosity, which is 10 to the minus 5. Those units have been set in such a way that they will all perfectly cancel out. It's kind of a pain in the neck because that viscosity has a Pascal in it, um, but you should try to work that out uh, if, it, if it's not abundantly clear. Well, I suppose it's not abundantly clear, but if you don't believe me, um, work them out. In fact, even if you do believe me, work them out because um, you're going to have to work them out and you should never trust someone else. Um, I make mistakes all the time. The friction factor we are always just gonna use that expression um, that we have given above. This is not the case all the time. Um, when you go to 101A, you will see that the friction factor is not universally 0 0.0791 divided by the Reynolds number to the one quarter power. It's not the case. Um, but it's a good enough approximation everywhere that we need it, uh, that we're just gonna use it everywhere. So this will be 1.229 times 10 to the fifth raised to the one quarter power. I routinely forget that one quarter power, so I'm just gonna highlight it. Don't forget the one quarter power. Our resulting friction factor F is 0 0.00042. This is also unitless. So it, it will have no units associated with it. Now we can plug that into our um, pressure drop equation. So we'll have dp dv uh, will be equal to minus v times our friction factor, which is 0, 0, 0, 0,0042 times 128 times our mass flow rate, which is 0 0.0193 divided by pi cubed, dimensionless number, and our diameter in meters. 0 0.02 to the seventh. Diameter does not need to be in meters, but if you're working in base, base SI units, then it needs to be in, in um, units of meters. So the end result here is minus 2.614 times 10 to the eighth times V. Don't forget the V. We did not actually solve for V, right? The V is sitting here. The V is something that we now have to calculate. Um, the units that we have on here, if you were to work this out, are now gonna be base SI units, which is a Pascal per cubic meter. Those units, I'm telling you, they are a killer on this thing. Um, if, if the problem is not given to you with the appropriate set of units, that's, that's not good. It's kind of... So let's look at our concentration terms. Um, our concentration terms, remember that uh, in the denominator, um, we're not gonna have that, that P term. So previously we had seen that um, CA is equal to CB, uh, which is, they are both equal to CA zero times one minus XA divided by one plus XA. But the only reason that they were, well, one of the reasons they were one minus XA over one plus XA is because we had previously canceled out the T terms, right? So the T terms and the, the P terms. So we have a P zero over P and we have a T over T zero. 
right? Those were there. If you look back up in your notes, they were there when we first wrote those concentrations, but we were able to get rid of them both because it was isothermal and isobaric. However, now we can only get rid of this one because it's isobaric, or it's, excuse me, isothermal, but we have to keep the pressure term because it's no longer isobaric, right? The, the pressure term, the P that sits down in the bottom, this P is this P. And that P is now varying along the length of the reactor. So we can't get rid of that. We can't say that P0 is equal to P because this system is not um, isobaric. The V term that we have is also problematic, right? V is equal to V0 times NT over NT0. We know that doesn't cancel because we're making two more moles than we started with. Uh, T over T0. P0 over P. Um, as we did a moment ago, we can get rid of the T over T0 because it is isothermal, but we cannot get rid of P0 over P because that is now a function, right? Um, P will vary as we go down the length of the reactor. If we wanted to rewrite this um, in terms of uh, conversion, so depending on which approach you're taking, right? Are, are you solving the original material balance in terms of Na? If you were, then you would leave it in this form. If you're uh, writing this in terms of um, conversion, then you have to use one of the things from um, chapter five uh, in order to rewrite this as V0 times one plus XA times P0 over P. Where did that come from? Uh, it, it was a mid, uh, stoichiometric analysis, but if, if you're worried about where it came from, it's exactly the same term uh, that we have right here. Because the denominator in our concentrations was a volumetric flow rate, um, and so it was, it was this term um, that we're, we're dealing with right there. Uh, but you can uh, flip back to chapter five, um, and this equation is, is derived in, in chapter five. It's optional, right? Um, optional in the sense of use this form if you're writing your material balance as DNA dV, because it'll probably be more convenient, but use this form if you're writing your material balance in terms of dxa dv. It's, it's only because we're, ch we're changing the, the variables. Um, beyond that, there's, those two are, are um, equivalent statements. So what we're set with then is a, a, a pair of coupled ordinary differential equations. Um, if we were to write them in MATLAB, our DNA dV, or sorry, let's do, did I write DX? Yeah, let's do DX. DXA dV. Most of it will look very similar to what it looked like um, in our, our previous example. So the constant that sits out front is still KCA0 squared divided by NA0. The part that changes is what's inside of here. Right, we still have our one minus xa, but now on the bottom we have one plus xa, which is what we had before, uh, times our new pressure factor. So I'm gonna keep that in red just so that you can see where this is entering. So there's our pressure factor, uh, and now this is still squared. It's still subject to the same initial condition, which is that xa at the beginning, at the entry to the reactor, is still zero. This is now coupled to dpdv, um, which we had just calculated a moment ago, that uh, coefficient that sits out in front of it, is minus 2.614 times 10 to the eighth. Now it's, it's times v, right? That was what we saw here. Um, this is our V term um, that's sitting here, and yet we have to use this form of V because V is not constant, right? It's, it's a, a gas phase system that's pressure is changing and the total moles are changing, so we have to replace V with something that looks like V, um, but that we can still calculate. So this is V0 times one plus XA. And now let's leave that um, pressure term in there as red again, just so that we can see exactly where it's um, entering. Notice that they're also coupled, right? The value of xa is a function of, or the rate of change of xa is a function of both xa and p. 
unfortunately, the rate of change of P is also a function of Xa and P. So this represents another set of, of coupled ordinary differential equations. Um, and so we have to solve them simultaneously in MATLAB because um, we don't really have a good way to do that um, otherwise. Here we have that P0 for our initial condition is 900,000 pascals. On the other hand, that's not a massive change from the, the code that we had before, right? About all that we have to do to change our code from before, I, I mean, it's fair, right? We have to put this entire equation in there, but our material balance didn't change very much, right? We just got to go in there and try to get the P0 over P um, and get that to appear in the right place. Um, and then obviously change our code to be a, a set of coupled differential equations instead of not coupled differential equations. Um, so let's flip over really quick. We've got four minutes. That should be just long enough that I can um, solve this over in uh, MATLAB. So let's switch over to MATLAB. I'm just going to start with exactly the same script that I have here. The first thing that let's do, let's, let's change it from solving one ODE to solving a system of ODEs. So what that means is we're no longer going to get uh, an XA coming out. We're going to now get Y. Right, because there's going to be more than one thing coming out. We're also not going to have a single initial condition. We're going to have a vector of initial conditions. Tube won't change. Um, our conversion will change a little bit, right? The, the print that we want here, uh, it's Y of the last row, but we're interested in column one um, because that's our, our conversion. It's going to come out in that way. Um, similarly, eh, where's my mouse? That's all right. We'll do it on a keyboard. We no longer are calculating dxa dv, we're doing dy dv um, because there's, there's more than one. And our input is now y. The pattern of our input is that xa is the first element of y uh, and p is the second element of y. And p is going to be in um, pascals. Similarly, we have an xa0 and we also need a p0, which is 900, 1, 2, 3 pascals. Our y0 is then the combination of these, xa0 and p0. Inside of our, our function down here, um, one of the things that we have to do is uh, change our denominator. Um, and I always get really confused about putting my parentheses down here in the denominator. What I need is for this term to now have a uh, P0 divided by P term sitting next to it. Um, so I'm going to write this times P0 divided by P, and then I'm just going to lump all of that in a bracket like that. This is no longer dy dv, this is dxa dv, or sorry, it was always dxa dv. And then our dp dv is everything that we had just said before, which is minus 2.614 times 10 to the eighth times v0 times a quantity of 1 plus xa times P0 over P. And this has units of pascals per cubic meter. And then we lump these into dy dv as dxa dv and dp dv. So if I did all of that correctly and I don't have any new, pro new parameters that I need to introduce, oh, I'm going to need p0 down there. I just noticed that. Um, p0 is 900, 1, 2, 3 pascals. Right, so our changes were fair, right? There was a, a few changes that were in there, um, but our material balance didn't change a lot. The biggest change in the material balance was P0 over P, and then we had to add this new DPDV sitting here. Um, if you had more terms, if it was both non-isothermal and non-isobaric, then you would have yet another one that down here for DTDV, uh, which would be equal to whatever. Um, that's fine, right? You can, you can solve as many of these as you want, this is very close to the most, excuse me, general type of problem that we can possibly solve. If you had other ones like DNA DV and DNB DV, et cetera, et cetera, not a problem. Just dump them all in there and lump them into your DY DV and MATLAB will solve them just fine. Um, it, it will not be a problem. So with one minute left, let's see if I made any errors here. I'm going to save this and run it and let's compare our conversion. There we go. Giant difference, right? 0.847 has now become 0.845. Um, that's how it goes. Uh, the, the pressure drop inside of tubes is usually not particularly high. Um, if, for example, we wanted to plot the pressure drop, um, we could do something like plot 
Y of all rows column two. This will be our pressure drop. Actually, it'll just be our absolute pressure. Um, let this, it's still calculating. I just need to get it to dock inside of my uh, figure. There we go. So there is our pressure. Uh, and we can see it didn't change very much, right? It started off at 900,000 pascals or, or 900 kPa, and then it only dropped to about 8.84, which is not really that big of a drop. Um, another way to look at pressure drop is as a fraction of what the inlet was. Um, so if I divide this by P0 and plot it, you'll see it starts off at basically 100%, and it only falls to about 98% of its inlet value by the time it, it leaves. So for Plug flow reactors, this is why we often associate, assume them to be isobaric. But if you don't know that ahead of time, you probably shouldn't assume it. And so you can include pressure drop in this form. Um, and we will revisit pressure drop. It will, I guarantee, become important with the next set of reactors that we have. Um, so we're, we're introducing it here um, to get ourselves started. So there we go. We're up to pressure drop in PFRs. Um, Friday's lecture, actually I'm going to take over for John on Friday, um, and we're going to talk about um, heat exchangers. Um, uh, the heat exchanger on a PFR has some interesting behavior to it. Uh, homework's due tomorrow at 11. I got to get a grade scope up for that, and I will see everybody um, Friday. Oh wait, okay, John's doing Friday. Cool. Uh, I'll, I messed up my dates then. Homework's due Thursday. For anybody sticking around, that's the end of the lecture. Um, but as always, I, I will uh, stick around for um, any questions that you might have. Oh, does it say Friday online? I mean, definitely follow whatever I've got on Canvas. If that's what I said on Canvas, that is what I'm doing. Let's check right now. I'm going to un... Yep, you guys are right. I am, I am wrong. Friday at 11 p.m. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to. I, now you're excited about the class, aren't you? Uh, no, sorry about that. Yeah, it's Friday. Friday at 11. We're gonna keep bumping homeworks back for this homework, the the one that you're doing right now, and the next one. They're they're both gonna get bumped back, but then we're gonna catch up on the remaining homework. Um, I'll just put a few fewer problems on the the remaining homework so that we can get caught back up in terms of time. My favorite Ghibli movie? I don't know that I've ever actually seen any of them, knowingly. Yeah, I know. For problem 4.2 is the energy balance needed. Let's take a look. If I were 4.2, where would I be? No, 4.2 is isothermal, um, so you won't need that one. Please watch my neighbor, Totoro. Okay, I'll add it. Done, I'll do it. No, so for 4.2, you don't need it need the energy balance, I mean. Um, to the, the question in chat about uh, part four, uh, it's just a coincidence. So for, for um, part B, you should s fix your volume um, to be exactly 450 liters. Um, don't, don't vary the volume for part B on problem four. It, it's just, a, that's where that came from, is I accidentally made a typo and used that number twice. Um, it, it's just a poor coincidence of a typo. The, for part four, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
what you said. You guys ever seen the dog in MATLAB? There's a dog in MATLAB. I think there's a pouty girl too. Are there any corrections for part B? Uh, no, part B is... Should be okay. A peak around 360K, that's that's pretty close. It's okay if there's some variation for part B. Um, it's okay. I think there's a pouty girl too. Uh, what is it? I think it's, is it pow? sure if I didn't extend mine just uniformly does it uniformly fall it, it may turn around and start to go up again um, but generally the the shape that you're looking for for that one let me switch back over to the sketch here so I can just sketch it Something like that. I don't remember if it actually starts to turn around here or not, or if it continues to go down. I, I don't remember. Mm, that suggests there might be a typo somewhere. If, if yours is sort of like exploding upwards like this or something i don't i don't think it should do that because this is out to 400k right here is 400k and this is 275 so double check something the song playing right now is at 3319 in there it doesn't actually say what that is. You're welcome. Um, since 4.2 doesn't require the energy balance, do we only vary T in the rate constant? Uh, yes. So it, it's less so that, that T is being varied. It's just we don't know what T is. But it's constant, right? Whatever its value is, it's constant. Um, and so what you can do is set up the material balance, um, and you can solve the whole thing and end up with an equation. You can integrate it and end up with one equation and one unknown, and that unknown will be t. The reason you're, you can get away with that is because we know t is constant, so it doesn't change the way that you have, you write the uh, material balance. It'll it'll just be end up being one of the parameters that um, you have to solve for after you solve for something like that. Six eighty three is pretty close to six fifty. Sure. I I try not to be particularly strict on how close is close, because uh, I mean if if you evaluate pi out to its full decimals and I use three point one four, that can potentially have a big impact, right? Um, so. I try to leave a fair amount of wiggle room in there with approximate answers um, because your approach can be entirely correct. Um, but if, if you round it slightly differently than I do, uh, like an intermediate calculation, right? If you're doing them by hand and you're only carrying around like two decimal points and I'm doing it in the MATLAB and it's carrying around like 40 decimal points, um, or however many come in the float, I think 
some number in the teens, um, it's, it's very easy to have differences of quite a bit. All right, I actually have a, a town hall, so you are all actually invited to the town hall. Um, you can uh, check your emails. Um, there should be a town hall for the department. Um, you're welcome to show up. I, I can't post anything right now because I got to get over there to that um, town hall. But again, all the code will be posted. Um, notes will be posted. Let's go ahead and stop this recording. If you're watching on YouTube, we will see you Friday. <laughs>